Hello, welcome to Analog Output. We're going to talk about all pass filters. Now, you probably know what a low pass filter is. You put in a sine wave with a low frequency and it gets passed through at full amplitude. You put in a sine wave at the center frequency of the filter and it gets attenuated. You put in a high frequency sine wave, it gets blocked. And a high pass filter, all the way around, low frequency sine wave gets blocked, high frequency sine wave, full amplitude at the center frequency, it's attenuated. So what's an all pass filter? Well, low frequency goes through without attenuation, high frequency goes through without attenuation, center frequency goes through without attenuation, anything goes through with no attenuation, which sounds kind of useless except that I haven't talked about everything that's important here because these filters not only affect the amplitude they affect the phase that is if you take a look at the relationship in time between where the peaks and troughs occur on the input and where they occur on the output that's the phase if the peaks and troughs are lined up with each other that's a zero degree phase shift. And if they are opposite each other, that's a plus 180 degree phase shift. Or it might be a minus 180 degree phase shift. It works out to the same thing. Or you could be in between, you could have a minus 90 degree phase shift, you could have a plus 90 degree phase shift, you can have, you know, any of these numbers. The thing with an all-pass filter is it gives you different phase shifts at different frequencies. So a one-pole all-pass filter might give you a zero-degree phase shift at low frequency and a minus 90-degree phase shift at the center frequency and a minus 180 degrees at high frequency. And a two-pole all-pass filter will give you a different range of phase shifts. It might give you zero degrees at low frequency, minus 180 degrees at center frequency, and minus 360 degrees at high frequency. Minus 360 degree phase shift, meaning you've come full circle and you've come back around to essentially the same thing as zero degree phase shift. So what does a phase shift do to the sound? What if you take a sine wave and you phase shift it what change does that make to the sound? Well, it doesn't make any change at all. Your ear doesn't care where the sine wave starts and stops as long as it's a sine wave. It sounds the same. Okay, but what if you've got something that's not a sine wave? What if you've got like a square wave or a ramp wave or something else which is something you can think of as a combination of harmonic sine waves at different frequencies? Well, if you put that through the all-pass filter, the different harmonics will get different phase shifts. The low harmonics will get smaller phase shifts, the high harmonics will get larger phase shifts, and the result is when you add up those harmonics on the output, the output is a completely different shape than the input. You put a square wave in, you get some complicated thing out. And what does that do to the sound of it? Well it basically doesn't do anything to the sound of it. The thing is that your ear is very good at discerning what harmonics are present and what their amplitudes are, but it doesn't really pick up on what the phase relationships between these harmonics are. So if you have the same harmonics in the same amplitudes and you shift the phases around, it does very little to change the sound of the wave. Okay, so all this still sounds pretty useless. What's the point of all this? Well, there's a couple things you can do with an all-pass filter. One thing is you can take the output and you can mix it with the original input, and then you have harmonics that are phase shifted with respect to each other. So the ones that are in phase with each other get added together constructively and the ones that are out of phase with each other get subtracted, canceled out, 
and that does affect the sound. So when you have this mixed input plus all pass filter, you get a different sound. And this is, um, this is basically how you design a phaser. But there's another thing you can do. You can realize that there are circumstances where you don't care what the wave sounds like. What you care is what the wave looks like, what its shape is. And that circumstance is when you're talking about low frequency waveforms. So you've got a low frequency oscillator in your synthesizer and it maybe gives you a sine wave or a square wave or a ramp wave or a triangle wave. But if you take those waves and put them into an all pass filter, then they can give you a broad variety of different sorts of waveforms to play with. And if it's a voltage controlled all pass filter, you can use a control voltage to morph between one waveform and another. And that's the basis for this module here, the low frequency voltage controlled all pass filter. Okay, so how do you build an all pass filter? Well, I don't want to go into all the murky depths of the circuit design, but I'll just say that what we have here as a starting point is basically the MS20 filter clone by Rene Schmitz. I've changed some of the components values, but it's basically the same thing. And you can see that, uh, up on the top, you've got a section labeled exponential converter. This is just the part of the circuit that takes the linear input control voltage and converts it into an exponential control current, which is what you need to get one volt per octave response from the filter. In the middle you've got the filter itself uh, which has two sections that are more or less identical both giving you a 6 dB per octave low pass roll off. Below that there's a feedback loop which gives you the resonance and then there's the output section. Okay so to convert this into an all pass filter First of all, since this is intended to be used with low frequency waveforms, it doesn't really need to be one volt per octave. And in fact, I wanted bigger response than that. So I changed the value of this resistor here up to 2.7K. In the filter, for technical reasons, the output of the first stage needs to go into the minus input rather than the plus input of the second stage. And then you have these two capacitors here which determine the frequency range of the filter. And since we're intending to use this with low frequencies, those capacitors need to be larger. I bump them up to 100 nanofarads. For this all-pass filter, we don't need and don't want resonance. So that resonance feedback loop is just eliminated completely. And then for the output, instead of just taking the output of the second stage of the low pass filter and sending that to the output jack, instead there's this output section and it's labeled pole mixing. The idea with pole mixing is that you can take your input signal and your first pole output from the low pass filter and the second pole output and combine them in different ratios and what you'll get is different kinds of filter response. So for instance, if you combine the input and two times the one pole low pass filter output, you get a one pole all pass filter. Or if you take the input and combine it with four times the one pole low pass filter and four times the two pole low pass filter, you end up with a two pole all pass filter. So that's the circuit, and let's take a look at how it works. All right, here we have the all-pass filter. We've got a low-frequency oscillator going in there. We've got an even slower low-frequency oscillator going in on the control voltage, and we're looking at our two outputs. Got the corner frequency set up around the middle someplace. Uh, frequency control level is turned up, low frequency oscillator level is turned up. Uh, that's just in case you get 
clipping, you can uh, reduce the level of the input to reduce the clipping on the output. And we're seeing our square wave input here. And if we look at our one pole APF output, it's doing that. And if we look at our two pole, it's doing something different. Okay, so those are the kinds of shapes you get with a square wave. If I move this over to a triangle wave, and then change it to a sawtooth. Let me change that time scale for you. Okay, so we get some interesting and funky shapes. Of course, we can just morph this thing into an asymmetric triangle, too. That's the low-frequency oscillator I showed you. All right, what if it's a sine wave input? Let me center this up here and put it on sine wave. If you see it, put it on sine wave, you see that basically it doesn't change the shape really at all. It, it changes a little because it's not a perfect sine wave, but it's, and it's not a perfect filter, I suppose. But basically it's just phase shifting that sine wave, which is something that you might have some use for uh, if you want to have, for instance, two things controlled by a low frequency sine wave that uh, they're both in at the same frequency, but at different phases from each other. But mainly, this is intended for use with stuff that has harmonics on it. Okay, what I have now is I've got a noise source going into a sample and hold, and the sample and hold is being triggered by that square wave, which is also the input to the APF. So that means that each time a new pulse comes into the APF, a new control voltage comes in. So each output is different generally from the previous output. And we're seeing that on the bottom here. And if we take that and modulate an oscillator with it, it sounds like this. That's the voltage controlled all pass filter. If you would like to make one for yourself, or if you maybe have an idea for a modification of it that you'd like to do, there's a GitHub repository link down there. It's got the schematics, the circuit board design files, the Gerber's uh, documentation. Go ahead, have fun with it. One caveat, this circuit is designed around the LM. 13700 chip which went out of production about a year and a half ago in its through hole form and it's uh, no longer available from Mauser or from DigiKey but it still is available from some other places. Uh, Thonk has it, uh, Jameco has it, Tata has it, and uh, Farnell and Newark um, they say they don't have any in stock, but they say it is available for back order. So as of late 2022, you can still get these things. Uh, and that's if you don't already have a stash of them, if you didn't uh, stock up on them when they went out of production like I did. I 
got enough to last me for a good long while, I think. But if you find that you're unable to get this part, you still have some options. The LM13700 in its surface mount package is still in production. So you should be able to get that. If you're not averse to soldering surface mount, you do have a couple of options. One is that there is a little breakout board available that would allow you to essentially convert a surface mount LM13700 to something that could plug right into the footprint for the through hole LM13700. I haven't actually tried this, but I see no reason why it wouldn't work. Uh, another possibility, of course, is you can just download the circuit board design files, open them up in uh, KiCad, and replace the through hole footprint with the surface mount footprint and then get that fabricated. So there's ways to go even if you can't get the through hole part. Anyway, take a look at it. Hope you enjoy it and hope you stay tuned, subscribe, and I will see you next time on Analog Output.